welcome. Thank you for joining us today as we discuss the topic of domestic abuse in the church. We are so glad to have you here. I am Jen Nessler, the founder of Esther Company. <clears throat> Our vision is to see a world where abuse cannot hide and operate within the church walls and that every woman bound by abuse would be awakened, educated, set free, healed, and living empowered lives full of freedom and walking in their true identity and purpose. Also joining me today is Jake Kale. He leads the Apostolic Equipping Center at Threshold Church in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, as well as Jake Kale Ministries. And he and his wife, Anna, are part of the Esther Company team. And we are both so excited to have a special guest, Elizabeth Johnson, here with us today. Elizabeth is a homeschooling mother of 10 children, a speaker, a blogger, a podcast host, and best-selling author. Her viral blog and commentary on social and moral issues have launched Elizabeth as a thought leader on issues of importance to family and people of faith. And she most recently has used her platform where she reaches millions of people every month to expose abuse inside the church and advocates for victims. Elizabeth has been featured on many major media outlets such as Fox and Friends, the New York Times, the Christian Broadcasting Network, and the pulse behind all of her activism and commentary is her love for her family and her savior, Jesus Christ. Elizabeth, we are so honored to have you here today. Jen and Jake, it is so good to be with you. I love and honor you both and everything that you're doing for the kingdom. Thanks so much. So Elizabeth, I'll just jump right into it. Um, I have noticed that you've been more vocal recently on the topic of narcissistic abuse. Can you tell me more about why you've chosen to speak up on behalf of women being abused in the church? Sure. And I'd like to first say that we are not only addressing domestic abuse or what someone would consider physical abuse in this um, interview, but we are talking about all forms of abuse because abuse takes many forms. It is not always overt, but is oftentimes covert. And that's where uh, victims find themselves very confused. And I wish that I could say that I understood this problem. Um, and have always been using my platform to talk about it, but I did not become vocal until it happened to me. Um, I am not a victim of domestic abuse of any kind of physical uh, type, um, but I'll explain a little bit um, how it happened to me. When it happened to me, I was totally naive and thought that I must be the only woman in the world going through it. Um, this is Abuse happens not only in homes, but it also happens in churches. And there are many victims being abused inside churches by church leaders and pastors as well. So this topic is just very important for us to be addressing. And um, just to give you a little backstory, in 2020, I received the following excerpt from a uh, pastor, from my pastor in a letter. And it said, quote, whatsoever I bind or loose in judgment as a leader, the Lord stands behind. The rules will be what I decide. And it is you who will abide by them without argument and cheerfully. You are not broken before God. So you can't fit here. Fall on the rock and be broken or the rock will fall on you and grind you to powder. And I will never forget the look on my daughter's face when she stumbled across um, this abusive letter and had to breathe her way through an incoming panic attack because this was someone who was a leader in our lives and who had power and a measure of control. Um, over our lives. And I was publicly excommunicated from the church for seeking integrity in my marriage. Wow. I was entirely alone. I had no grid for this kind of narcissistic abuse and no community to help me walk through it. And my kids and I barely made it out. It was a nightmare. And we lost a lot in the process, Jen. But after about a year, I started a podcast and began to interview people like Pastor Jake and Leslie Vernick and Sarah McDougall and Patrick Weaver, um, just generals on this topic who I highly respect and who are teaching on navigating destructive and abusive relationships. And Jen, this is when my inbox 
got all of my inboxes got filled with the most horrifying stories. As I began to use my podcast and my platform to talk about abuse, um, I received the most alarming stories. It was so pervasive across every type of church and denomination. And I realized that I could not stay silent while victims were, were suffering. And the really hard, you know, come to Jesus moment for me, Jen, was that if I was going through this as a public figure and a leader, that this was probably far more widespread of an issue than I was willing to admit, right? You know, I, I literally ha had this letter sent to me um, pretty much within the same week or two the letter I just quoted to you from my pastor, the same week as the White House is calling me to work with them on projects. Mm -hmm. I'm being emotionally and spiritually threatened behind closed doors. And, you know, I realized that I might look put together and not fit the stereotype of an abuse victim, but that is what people often fail to understand, right? Is that abuse takes so many different kinds of forms and it victimizes sometimes the unlikely. And so it is very important that we, um, that we educate uh, victims to become overcomers and survivors. And that is why I began to get vocal without going into a lot of detail. Yeah. Wow. That is incredible. That's incredible. Yeah. I'm just curious. Um, have you, what has been the reception, I guess, from other leaders since you've been more vocal on this topic? Wow, um, there has been an overwhelmingly supportive response from mm -hmm. obviously abuse survivors mm -hmm. and also from those who love justice and righteousness, uh, mm -hmm. which is the majority of people that are following me. So um, I've been so encouraged and excited to see that. The only negative response that I receive is really from people who value institutions and mm -hmm. protecting institutions and ministries above protecting victims. Yeah. And as far as I'm concerned, those people are corrupt and complicit and I don't respect their criticisms anyway. So yeah. there's that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think to go back to the point that you said about it could be the most unlikely, I think that's probably one of the mis most misunderstood about victims of narcissistic abuse is that yes they're actually predatorial and they are seeking out women who have you know integrity and they're creative and they're strong and they're because they offer up this beautiful mirror to reflect back to the to the narcissist of what they mm -hmm. don't possess what they don't have mm -hmm. um and i think that's the thing is you know Sometimes they're, you know, the stereotypical is that you come from a broken home or you have low self-esteem. And sometimes those things are the case, but there's also those people who wind up in wonderful marriages, you know? And so the thing is, is sometimes bad things happen to good people, but they really are predators who know the kind of woman or it can happen to men too, that they're seeking out. So I think that's important that, you know, what you shared. Um, yeah, I'm Jake. Very important, Jen. And I was guilty of believing that stereotype. Yeah. before I watched it happen to me and, and my children, I was so guilty of believing that stereotype. And I, you know, I'm, I feel badly about that and I'm going to write that wrong by being a voice. Mm, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to ask um, Jake to speak to the, this next point in a minute, but um, yeah, I guess in what ways have you seen the church respond um, to situations of abuse? I mean, I'm not sure Ooh. if it could be your specific situation or just in general. Yeah. No, let me speak to this in general. We see minimization of pornography and sex addiction, for instance. We see victims being told to submit more to their husbands and provide more sex for them as the solution to uh, their, their husband's addiction. We see gaslighting of the victims. In my story, you have a public excommunication. Did you know that public excommunications of victims might happen more frequently than you would want to admit in the body of Christ? I cannot believe the number of stories that I have been told or been emailed um, where women suffered what I suffered. Um, and we've just recently seen one come out very publicly in Grace Community, Community Church that has become a, a new story. 
um, in John MacArthur's church where uh, the victim was excommunicated. And now her um, ex-husband is, I believe, in jail for um, being a pedophile, for sexually abusing children. Um, we see uh, church leaders demanding couples counseling, which is very re-traumatizing to victims instead of individual counseling being recommended while the abuser's behavior is being dealt the strong hand that it needs and the abuser is getting help that, that they need. We see couples counseling, which, oh, this is so triggering. And it's, it's a form ultimately of secondary abuse as a couple goes into counseling and a, you know, good hearted victim that is being preyed on by an abuser is being blamed for the abuser's behavior in front of the counselor. And the victim has to sit there and pray to God that this counselor and therapist is not duped. And they often are duped because the abuser is always apologetic and they can be very manipulative and convincing. So these are some of the things we're seeing happening in the church and abuse is not always easily recognized. I get it, it you know, because again, the abuser is manipulative. They are convincing. They are often charming and often very repentant uh, with their words. And I understand that that can be confusing for leaders. And so this is why the church has to be trained on effectively recognizing and responding in these situations. And I believe that every church leader, Jen, should um, take the four tools of abuse course at Psalm 82 Initiative. You can go to psalm82initiative.org and uh, register for the four tools of abuse framework course. I believe this should be required for anyone who is going to be in a leadership capacity in the church because we have got to do better. Yeah. Wow. That's so good. Yeah. Jake, I'd love to hear um, you share some thoughts just from a pastor's perspective on this. Yeah, absolutely. It's such, such an important topic. And uh, I'm, just, I'm, I'm glad to hear more people are stepping up, more people are beginning to voice and be vocal. And I think God is really putting his finger on this mm. topic because there's just been so much that's been swept under the rug and for years and years and years. And I just, yeah, I just really sense that th th there is an awakening in this area just so that healing can come, justice can come, reformation can come. And I know for me as a church leader, it was probably three, four or five years ago, really when I began to see this topic from a new perspective from a new light. And it was because my wife and I were involved in a situation where there was abuse happening and we were close enough to the situation and we were involved in it for a long enough period of time that we began to see things more and more clearly as time went on. And so like these light bulbs were starting to happen as we're seeing the patterns of hypocrisy, this, you know, the, the public persona, the public portrayal of living a godly, holy life while behind closed doors, there is abuse mm -hmm. verbally, emotionally, sexually, all, all, all types of stuff, spiritually. And you know, the, the whole false repentance, the thing that Elizabeth just mentioned, just that, you know, using words to apologize and sound sincere, but then the behavior never changes or it's just an act. It's just kind of a way to manipulate and just to change the circumstances. And so it was a real awakening for myself. It was a real mm -hmm. awakening for, um, for, for my wife and I as we we're walking in, in this situation. And from that time, we just you know, we just, you know, we made some choices that, that we were going to be vocal, that we were going to stand on the side of, of the victim and um, which, which is costly, but it's, but it's the right thing to do. And ever since that time, it's just been like the floodgates have opened and we've just been involved in so many different types of situations. We've, we've seen it happen and, you know, more, more, more times. And I think for, for church leaders, I think one of the first steps is we have to be willing to see. I think, I think we have to be willing to see, we have to be willing to slow down and see, we have to, we have to humble ourselves to learn something maybe that we, uh, is, 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 is new for us, but I often liken it to the whole story of the, um, the good Samaritan, the parable of the good Samaritan, where here, here are these leaders, these, it was a priest and a Levite that were walking down the road. And here's this victim on the side of the road who's been beaten, who's been robbed. He's half dead. It says, and the priest walks by and the Levite walks by 
And I think that's how we have often, I say we as just the church as a whole, that's in general how we have often handled situations of abuse. Mm-hmm. We've actually just walked right by. Maybe it's, maybe it's out of ignorance. We, we're blind to it. Um, but I think often it's out of convenience because abuse is an inconvenient truth. Mm-hmm. It's, it's so much easier just to pretend it's not there. It's so much easier to gloss over. It's so much easier just to kind of maintain the status quo. And so I think in, in, in so many ways, uh, church leaders will just kind of walk by and not want to get their hands dirty, not want to get involved, not want to take sides. And, you know, we, so, so we have to be willing to see. We have to be willing to learn. We have to be willing to take sides and stand on the side of a victim when it's a true situation of abuse. And that's, that's costly, um, but that's the right thing to do. That's what Jesus calls us to do as shepherds of God's people, right? The, the shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Um, mm-hmm. the, the shepherd doesn't run when a wolf comes. The, the shepherd protects the, the sheep. And so uh, I, I, I think there's so many things we could, we could talk through in that, but just as a broad picture, mm-hmm. uh, I think for church leaders, it's, it's so key that we humble ourselves and be willing to learn and see clearly and then take actual steps to be proactive to, to do this well, because it is happening in our churches. And if you're leading, if you're watching this and you're a church leader and you're, you're, you're seeing this video, it's happening in your church. There, there is abuse happening, whether it's domestic, emotional, physical, spiritual, sexual, there's, there's abuse type things happening. And uh, it's so important that we really get the heart of God on this um, and do a better job moving forward. Mm-hmm. What would you say, Jake, would be a few practical steps for a pastor who this whole topic of covert abuse, where it's more hidden, um, I guess, what are some practical steps that they could do to implement their church being a safe place? Yeah, so I think um, learning the nature of abuse, like learning, like learning more about like being educated would be a great first step on the nature and tactics of abuse, because it can be hard for a person who has a pure heart for God. If you're, if you're seeking God, you love the Lord, you have a pure heart, you have a clean conscience. It's hard for you to imagine that a person can live such a deceptive lifestyle, that they can yeah. live such a, uh, such a double life, that, they, that a person can lie to your face and claim to be a Christian. They're like, they claim to be a Christian. They could quote the Bible. You know, they can, they can um, act you know, a certain way. They can act like they're worshiping God. So I think learning about the nature and tactics of abuse through books, through resources, just to help understand what we're dealing with here, that, these, that this is real. I think we've been too naive to it. We've been too naive to the nature of evil, the nature of abuse and hypocrisy. So I think learning is a, is a huge step. Um, I think then you know, developing some frameworks for, okay, how do we handle situations of abuse? Uh, whether it's, you know, a child that gets abused, whether it's a domestic abuse, you know, marital situation, I think developing some healthy procedures, policies, okay, this is, this is our stance as a church on when these types of situations happen, you know, this is how we respond. And, you know, just really, you know, building a way that is, you know, biblical um, from the standpoint of justice and righteousness and truth Mm -hmm. and care for, for those who are oppressed. Um, you know, willingness to stand with the, um, the victims. And then I think a third one is just tangible support, like tangible support for people who have been or are being, you know, victimized by abuse. So that could be prayer ministry, that could be counseling, that could be financial help, you know, uh, that could be just, just even just a people to support them in, in conversation and prayer, just to be there for them, you know, can be a huge uh, help. And uh, it's, again, it's costly. It's just, just like the Good Samaritan, it was costly. He had to get involved. He, he paid for the person's, you know, hotel stay in the parable and he used his own oil and wine. And, and that's what we have to do. We have to be willing to, to really pay that price because it's worth it because these are God's people and, and that's his heart. And so, yeah, getting educated, you know, getting, um, you know, um, good policies. You know, I think Elizabeth brought up a great point about how very often, we, we push people to couples counseling. And so that's, that's one of the things that we've learned in our, in our mm-hmm. culture at, at our church is that when there's situations of you know, marital problems, we don't just push people to counseling. We try to actually assess, okay, what is going on here in this marriage? You know, is this a situation where it's just difficulties and communication issues, 
but but they're actually two solid people that love God and that are both both right. involved. They're both trying. Then 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 counseling can be helpful. But if it's a situation of a destructive relationship, if there's any type of abuse involved, it's one sided. Where like you know maybe the woman is the one that's trying. She's she she's, she she wants her marriage to be saved and she's truly you know pu- putting in the effort. And then you know the husband is you know addicted to porn and uh, abusing her and just in this whole cycle for years and years, rather than just pushing them to couples counseling, um, you know, we, we have a different approach now. And we, we encourage individual separate type of counseling if there's gonna be counseling. And then we wanna educate, you know, the, the victim on what's actually happening and obviously never force a victim to make any choices or decisions. We just wanna be there to support, to educate. But yeah, so I think those are some, some tips and some ways and we're, we're still learning, we're still growing in this. Um, But I think it's we we have to get some of those foundational things right in place. So we stop re-victimizing people. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Jake. And and, and I'll I'll just add one more thing, too, is um, if if anybody should be removed from the church, it's the the abuser. Uh, It's it's the it's the one who is, you know, as as the Bible would call a wolf in sheep's clothing. Right. I mean, somebody who is yep, being a yep. predator or an abuser, but they're portraying themselves in a certain way. That's a wolf in sheep's clothing. Um, that's the person that, that should be asked to not come to the church. Yeah. So that's so good. Yeah. Elizabeth, I'm curious if a woman came to you and she is just learning about narcissistic abuse or otherwise known as hidden abuse, what would be um, some advice you might give to her? The first thing I think I would tell her to do is to go to leslievernick.com and take the emotionally destructive marriage assessment test. It's a quiz. It's brief. Doesn't take you long to do, but it is so eye opening mm-hmm. and it helps a woman determine whether she's just being emotional and she is just struggling in her marriage at the moment and they can work through it or whether she is suffering in an abusive and destructive relationship. So again, that is at leslievernick.com. Vernick is spelled V-E-R-N-I-C-K and take the emotionally destructive marriage assessment. And then the next thing I would tell a woman to do is to download an app called Trauma Mamas. This app was created by my friend, Sarah McDougall, who is a coach for uh, victims of abuse. And she has created an amazing tool for for women. Um, She ministers to women and the app is called Trauma Mamas. And you literally type Trauma Mamas into the app store. Mamas is spelled M-A-M-A-S. And I cannot tell you how many resources are there Uh, whether it is as desperate as hotlines or whether it is more educational in nature, the tools are across the board. And um, these are, these are the two main things, first things that I would provide to a woman who is just having her eyes opened to what a desperate situation she's in and does not feel like she at the moment has that support network around her that understands it, those would be two wonderful things for her. Yeah, that's really good. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Jake, do you have any other um, thoughts or maybe even questions for Elizabeth? Yeah, no, it's uh, again, yeah, thanks Elizabeth for sharing those those resources too. It's, it's huge, hugely helpful. Um, just, I think that first step is often gaining clarity, you know, just that yes. kind of, opening of like, okay, wait, this is actually what I've been living in for X amount of years. This is why it's so confusing. This is why it's so, yeah. you know, it's been such a swirl and there's so much confusion. Um, I mean, I guess maybe, maybe one question or, you know, thing that we could chat about or just real, real quickly is, you know, any, is there any, uh, on the, on the, the, the side of, you know, healing, you know, how does a person begin to heal from mm-hmm. the effects of being in an abusive environment or a relationship again, in different contexts? Do you have any thoughts on that or, or things to, to share on that? Yeah. I love what you said, by the way, going back to what you said about clarity, that is so important (laughs) and such a huge first step in the journey because anyone dealing with abuse is in a fog typically, and that fog can last 
um, even after getting out of it for years. It can take a couple of years to come out of that fog. And that is even with surrounding yourself by healthy people. There are so many things that be, you begin to see. I cannot believe that I tolerated that. I cannot believe that I allow that to be minimized. I can't believe I didn't act sooner or that I didn't get help sooner. Now that you're on the other side of the fog, you can see that clearly, but there's so many people right now under the sound of our voice mm -hmm. who are still in that fog and they don't have that clarity. And they think it's okay that when they go to their husband and say, I'm not okay with you watching this. This is not okay. This does not honor God that he quotes scripture to her and calls her a Jezebel and says, she's a rebellious woman and that she needs to just, you know, be quiet. And, and the, the number of people listening right now who are in that fog is way larger than we want to admit in the body of Christ. And so the clarity is super important. And honestly, when I read Leslie Vernick's website and took that test and read her book, um, that was honestly one of my first moments of clarity of what I had been dealing with. And it was a major part of my, of my journey. Now to what, what you asked, um, healing. First of all, the church is notorious for <laughs> hating on therapists and therapy, right? Uh, for minimizing the need for therapy and making it seem like all of our problems are so spiritual that we do not need to speak to a professional therapist. And I personally would like to be a voice that says otherwise and recommends um, getting um, a licensed therapist involved in your situation and, um, and getting the necessary healing that you need in that way. Definitely, I would highly encourage therapy. I have, um, you know, paid quite a bit of money to attend therapy for months and to make sure that I was dealing with not only what had been done to me, but also just my, my whole backstory of my life and going back to my childhood and making sure that I'm not carrying into my future um, any uh, dysfunction, any pain, bitterness that is going to be a shackle around um, my, my my ministry, my my future. I want the fullness of all that God has for me and my family, and so therapy can be a, a beautiful part of that journey. Um, making sure that you're in a healthy church environment, a place where they understand abuse, a place where they are not trying to control you. If you can recognize that you're in an environment where control is a problem, um, I'm going to encourage you to see how fast you can get out of that door and find a, a healthy place to worship God and to, and to be supported. That's really good. Yeah, I, I actually saw this t-shirt and it said Jesus and counseling. <laughs> and it's funny because a lot of times in church, it's like, we don't want to put the two together. But there's, yeah, there's healing body, soul, mind, and spirit. And so there's absolutely, I feel like spiritual healing yeah. and things were powerful for me, but there's physical ramifications many times and all kinds of healing. So yeah, that's, thank you for sharing that. I think that some women need to know it's okay to go to counseling, that it's okay. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. That is really great. Yeah, is there anything else, Jake, that you have or Elizabeth that you would like to touch on that we might not have covered at this point? No, I would just encourage, you know, those again that are again speaking from a church leadership perspective. I just I would encourage, you know, leaders and, and churches and those that are that are responsible for overseeing and leading and serving and shepherding, just to um, yeah, to to take this conversation seriously and pray about it, seek seek the Lord about it, but also um, again, just be aware that. It, it's, it's already happening. So it's just a matter of how can we actually do a good job of addressing this in a way that honors Christ and that reflects his heart, reflects his nature. Uh, and so I just want to encourage those that are pastors or leaders to not turn a blind eye, to not pretend like it's not happening, to be willing to inconvenience ourselves and to really lay down ourselves to do the right thing in this, because uh, that's, that's what God calls us to do. I mean, that's what, that's what his heart is. And so yeah, I just want to continue to just put that out there and just, you know, any, any way that I can do that for my position, I want to 
you know, be a voice into this, in this area. That's very good. Yeah. And I, I want to thank Jake for what he said about being a good Samaritan, uh, because, you know, it, it's kind of, this is where the church often we drop the ball. We want, let's say, for instance, on the issue of abortion, we want to be vocal. We want to encourage people to vote pro-life. But other than that, nobody really wants to get their hands very dirty into the situation. You know, they want to they want to say I'm pro-life and they want to kind of scream and shout at, at the, the the murderers, you know, who are pro-abortion. But have they actually paid the rent of a mother who is struggling to provide for her child? Have they thrown a baby shower for a woman who's chosen life? Have they actually helped a woman find a job who lost her job and doesn't know how she's going to feed her, her children? Um, people, people stop at talking. Mm -hmm. And um, what I love about what Jake said and what I, I know that he has practiced uh, as a pastor is actually getting your hands dirty and getting involved and, and helping the victims. I personally, over the last two years, have spent over $140,000 in legal fees defending myself in you know, this situation, very abusive situation, legally and financially abusive situation. And it has felt so frightening and alarming at times. And to have the body of Christ walking alongside of you and holding your hand, and maybe they don't have money to give, but maybe you can go hold a woman's hand in court as she's shaking um, in court, going through another hearing. There are so many ways that the body of Christ can be there, like the Good Samaritan, but unfortunately, we're often finding that they, like Jake said, they just kind of want to, you know, oh, I don't really want to get involved. This seems sticky. This seems messy. And um, I just don't think that that is, that is what Jesus would want us to model. Mm -hmm. It makes me think of the scripture of that. It says that he's close to the broken hearted and a bruised reed. He won't snuff out. We tend to think of that just as like, yes, that God is close, but I don't know. I just think of the body. It's like, I want to be where Jesus is. <laughs> and so reading yes. that scripture in light of he's close to the broken hearted, maybe sometimes we're missing out on his presence and his goodness simply because we haven't sat close to the brokenhearted. So I love that you share that, Elizabeth. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you um, for joining us today. I don't want to, I want to honor your time, um, but I just appreciate you being a voice of truth and just speaking out on this really important subject. Um, to hear more from Elizabeth, you can find her on Facebook and Instagram. And she also has a blog, which is um, elizabethjohnston.org and I'll have something underneath the screen so you can click on that to find her. You can also, um, Elizabeth will be joining us at the end of this month at our Esther Company Abuse Awareness Dinner in Lancaster, Pennsylvania on June 25th. So you can register and go to Esther Company. Um, it's esther-company.com and check out our events page if you'd like to join us. And yeah, thank you so much for being with us today, Elizabeth. Just appreciate you and just your voice. And yeah, thank you, Jake, for for joining and just um, excited to be with you both at the end of the month.